So then my teacher called me to uh, his room. He was the abbot of the monastery, and he called me to his room and he said, you know, you're the first uh, foreigner in 600 years to graduate from our, our monastery. And so congratulations. And they give you a little white scarf called a kata. They, they hang it around your head. And then he said, uh, but you know, as a foreigner, uh, we have a second examination for you. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, you didn't mention any second examination. <laughs> then he said, oh yeah, uh, you go to New York, uh, you start a business, uh, you prove that you understand what we taught you. Because they supposedly they teach you how to shift the future, how to change the future, how to shape your future. You know, if you understand the, the laws of karma, then supposedly you can adjust your future path and you can make things happen. So they said, your examination is second examination. Go to New York, start a business, make a million dollars, we'll give it away to the refugees because we're not allowed to keep money. So uh, then I fought with him for like, I don't know, six months. It was like a silent standoff. You're not supposed to say no to the Lama. You think those rosaries are for uh, prayers? <laughs> you get this, <laughs> they, they will hit you. And then you get these red dots across your forehead. <laughs> In the monastery, that's what the rosaries, the teachers use the rosary. That's why all those Tibetan monks are so uh, well-mannered. Uh, 25 years of rosaries. <laughs> Then, uh, so eventually I went to New York and, we, and I, I did start a business. We started with three people. And then now it has reached about, now it's about 250 million a year. And it, it is owned by Warren Buffett. Um, and then people ask me, how did you do that? You know, people started asking me, how did you do that? And then my friends and I, we started giving trainings uh, with different companies around the world. and. Uh, I wrote that book, and the book has been translated into many languages in countries I don't know about, and editions I don't know about. A lot of them are black market, but in Russia and China, for example, it's used quite extensively, and we've been uh, approached by a Russian company. They just got back from Russia. Uh, they have 32,000 employees, uh, banking and petroleum, and uh, each employee is required to read the diamond cutter uh, in Russian. And uh, I don't know who's printing it, but it's interesting. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, like that, same in Beijing and China. Uh, so we often go to China. We're, we're there, I don't know, three months a year. And we train uh, companies in China about these principles. One day in uh, southern China, in a place called Guangzhou, which is where all the stuff in the world is made, probably the chair you're sitting on, uh, outside of Hong Kong. And then um, I gave a business talk you know, how to use diamond cutter principles uh, to be successful financially. And then one lady raised her hand. They go like this, right? They don't go like this. <laughs> you know, and she said, Why, Shama, you know, how do you, can you use this to fix your husband? <laughs> you know, can, can you use karmic principles from diamond cutter? They call Jing Kan Jing. They have the diamond cutter sutra. It's the oldest printed book in the world. And can you use those principles to fix your husband. Then if some guy, of course, raised his hand and said, I want to fix my wife. <laughs> you know? And I said, yeah, I guess you could. I mean, they don't train us in the monastery for that. But, <laughs> but uh, then we started, people started asking. And, and uh, then someone came and said, I have breast cancer. Can you use these things? Can you use these principles for a serious health problem? Then obviously, uh, many people come and say, I. I have enough money and I have a good relationship and I'm healthy but I, I want peace in my mind. I want inner peace. Can you use these principles to have a peaceful mind and a quiet mind? And you can. And then of course, really, almost everywhere we go in the world, and we go many, many countries, uh, in the end someone will ask, can you use these principles for world peace? Can you create uh, a, a world without poverty or sickness? Uh, is it possible to use these ancient teachings uh, for a world of peace? 
And uh, what's, what's interesting is that if you learn uh, this particular system uh, of life, right? It's just a way of conducting your life. And it's basically through ethical principles, but in a special way. Uh, if you learn it uh, to achieve your own goals in life, which you can, and I did, uh, then you can automatically, because of the because of the nature of this method, you are helping the world also. You are creating a better world and a more peaceful world and a, and a more prosperous world. So just to learn these principles and to try to put them into practice, uh, automatically you are helping to create a better world. It's, it's a nice system. By achieving your own goals, uh, you are helping the world already. And we'll talk more we have two nights uh, to talk about it, and uh, I'll get to it by tomorrow, okay? <laughs> by tomorrow evening. I, I thought, uh, so those are the basic goals that people have in their lives. I've been teaching, I don't know, uh, over 30 years, and uh, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people, and um, people basically in their life, they want financial security. I don't mean greedy, I don't mean you want three uh, cars because you only have one bottom, you know, uh, or you want a 20-room house when you can only sleep in one of those rooms, but people would like to be financially independent. People would like to be able to buy what they want and have what they want and do what they want without thinking about money, you see? Like, we would all like to reach a point in our finances where we just don't have to think about money. The money comes, and we do the things we want. Actually, most people in the world, when they talk to me, they want to become wealthy, they want to have financial independence, but in the end, most of them want money because they want to help other people. They want to uh, donate money, or they want to help other causes, like the Bill Gates and the Warren Buffetts of the world. Uh, when you have enough money, when you reach what I call oxygen money, when money is like oxygen for you and you don't have to think about it, uh, then you become even more generous and you start helping other people. So many people, I think, it's not a selfish reason. They would like to be financially independent so they could help more people. And then naturally, people would like to have a beautiful partner. It's lonely to have a lot of money and, and to have no friends or to have no, no beautiful partner in your life. And then, of course, people would like to have good health. I think uh, all of us would like to have energy, youthful energy. We would like to be young. Uh, it's a drag getting old. It's a drag getting tired. It's a drag uh, to have your mind uh, become more dull as the years go by, and, and to know that you were more creative before, and you, you can't be as creative now. I mean, all of us would like to be able to affect our, our mind and our energy. Uh, this is basic three desires of a human life. Uh, in this system in which I was trained, so I was trained very, very strictly for 25 years, and it's a very strict program. It's a very, very difficult. Uh, we start at 3.30 in the morning, and we go till 10 or 11 at night, and it, there's no break. And a lot of the, the young men go crazy. I mean, we lose uh, a typical class before you reach a geshe, we, you might start with 60 monks, and in the end we had four. Uh, so it's a very difficult uh, program. But if you, if you get through it and if you understand it, uh, then you can make stuff happen in your life, and it's like magic. So I just go around the world. I don't care. I'm not trying to make people Buddhist. It's not my interest. Uh, I don't care what picture you have in your house. It doesn't matter to me. I still go to All Saints Church. I sneak in there uh, on Sunday, the early service, and uh, down the street. And um, I don't care. I, I don't think uh, most of us can relate to a, a blue 12-armed uh, God. You know what I mean? I, and it, to me, it doesn't matter. Uh, the principles that I would like to speak about, and that I'm grateful for Robbie for organizing this talk, uh, they are universal, and they are beautiful, and they can, and you can change your life, and you can change the lives of other people. So it's just something, learn it, uh, take away what you would like, 
it, it won't work if you don't try it. Try it quietly on your own. Uh, you don't have to report back to anybody. And um, see if you get $200 million or something. You know, and, and not because we are greedy people, but because we can help more people. And, uh, and I have, with the money I have, uh, 25 years of uh, supporting Tibetan refugees. We just finished uh, the last ancient book from India, 4,600 books. It took 25 years. We just finished typing in the last book about a month ago. It went up online. Uh, we cataloged 141,000 texts in St. Petersburg, Russia, in the Hermitage. That was finished last year. And we're cataloging uh, all the books in Mongolia. That's 16 years now. Uh, but you, those take money. It takes money to do good things and great things. So here we go, all right? Uh, and use it, try to use it, okay? Just try it yourself, quietly. Try it, try it for your own life. It's a way of planting your future. It's a, I, I, have a, I live in Rimrock, which you never heard of. It's near Camp Verde, which you also barely heard of. Camp Verde for us is the big city. Rimrock is worse. Uh, but I, I live on a mesa, and I, I, I garden. You know, I do gardening, and uh, this is the time of year when I plant. You know, and I have a huge box of seeds because all my friends give me seeds, useless seeds from Germany, China, Russia, things that will never grow in Arizona. So first I throw out all those, and then there's like five boxes left, and then... Um, I make a drawing of the garden as I want it to be by June or July. And I have to consider which plants will grow first and which flowers will open at what time and who's taller than other ones because I won't be able to see them from the porch if I did what I did last year, which was I planted the zinnias in front of everything. I couldn't see anything behind them. And, and you plan your garden, right? You can plan your future and your life in the same way. I want to have this income by next year, this time. Uh, I would like to improve these relationships, or I would like to have this kind of person in my life by next year, this time, or six months from now. Or I have a bad back and I would like it to be gone. Or I would like my youthful energy back. Or I would like my husband to be affectionate again, or things like that. You can plant them according to this ancient wisdom. Can you show diamond cutter? Uh, according to this ancient uh, wisdom, this is the oldest printed book in the world with a date on it. It's kind of a bad, it's a Google image, okay? Uh, but inside there is this wisdom, and uh, I can give you 25 years of it in two nights, okay? And then you can start using it. You really, you can start using it, okay? So we'll just start, all right? There are new ideas. There are some new ideas, all right? And, they, and you have to stretch your mind. You have to open your mind and you have to stretch it, okay? It's, if it's something you heard before, you would have $200 million. Uh, it's something new. And then you have to, you have to try and, and stay with me, okay? So we'll do it the old way, the old uh, Tibetan way, 1,000 years old. I'll ask you a question. You have to answer, uh, what do you call it, enthusiastically. I also have a rosary here. Uh, <laughs> the people in the front row, row get the, they, get, they suffer for the others, okay? Uh, so uh, I'll ask you a question. Don't be shy and just, okay. so here we go. What is this thing? Yeah, it's a pen. She, she's, she's interested in answering correctly because she's in the front row. Uh, Question, if a dog came in here from the, that door, if a small puppy dog came in here and, and, I, and I, you know, whistled to it and I said, you know, and I waved this thing in front of the puppy dog, what would they do? Yeah, they would chew on it. Do they see this object as a pen? No, they don't. They see it as something to chew on, right? They see it as a chew toy. This sounds like basic questions, but they are important. And they are $200 million questions, really, seriously. And not just money, I mean relationships. You can have extraordinary relationships at work and, and in your private life forever, if you understand these things. Who's right, the dog or the person? 
I think you can say both, and I think that's a really good answer, okay? The dog sees it as a, something to chew on. The human sees it as a pen. It is validly both a chew toy and a pen. There was only one guy in Florida in all of 30 years who insisted that it was a pen. And uh, it couldn't be a chew toy, and that the dog was wrong, you know? And uh, I'm sure the dog thinks we are foolish not to take advantage of the delicious taste, <laughs> you know, like, uh, anyway, they're both right. Now here comes the important question, okay? This is the deep question, and this is the basis of what I would like to share with you for two nights, okay? If I put this uh, object here on this table, and if all the people leave the room, and then if all the dogs leave the room, at that time, is it a pen or something to chew on? Which one? This is the universal answer. Every country, they will say, <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's universal. I don't know why. But there's some gestures that aren't universal. I've learned that. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I was in Brazil, and I did some gesture, and they, that was the wrong one. But uh, yeah, it's neither one. At that time, you can't, it's not a pen yet until the human walks back in. And it's not a chew toy until the dog walks in. Uh, left by itself with no people and no dogs around at that time, it's neither one yet. It's neither one yet. It has the, what do you call it? It has the potential to be either one. If the human returns or if the dog returns, it will become that. If they both walk back in, it will become both at the same time and there will be two realities in the, in the room, uh, parallel realities going on. But so long as there are no observers in the room, then for that long, this thing is, then that's the Buddhist uh, term is empty, emptiness. That's the meaning of emptiness. So I had this thing in, uh, when I first got to the monastery, you know, I'm this guy, I'm like a young hippie from Phoenix. And uh, <laughs> somebody gave me a photo today of my rock and roll band in high school. I haven't seen it for like 40 years. It's pretty funny. So that was me, you know, and I go to India, you know. And then uh, I got to the monastery and I, I said, you know, I, I want to study here. Na sangye go. I learned some Tibetan. It means, I want a Buddha. I want a Buddha. And then they, they said, okay, you can come. And then they gave me this tiny little cell. I could touch the walls with my hands, you know. And they said, you know, until you get to be a more senior monk, you can stay here, you know. So I, so I, I, I went in this tiny room, and the beds are all Tibetan size. See, Tibetans are all like five feet tall. So I used to sleep with my legs curled up. Nowadays they put me in the penthouse hotel in, some, in Beijing, and, and I still sleep curled up in the, in the corner of this huge bed, you know. So uh, then I, the Lama said, okay, you, do you understand how to meditate? And I thought, oh yeah, I, I know, I know. Then he said, do you know about emptiness? I said, I know, I know. Later he gave me a nickname. He, he didn't call me Mike, he called me uh, Mr. I know, I know. You know, that was my name in the monastery for like 25 years. I know, I know. Hey, I know, I know, get me a cup of tea. You know, so, uh, so he said, okay, meditate about emptiness. Then I'll ring the bell and you come up and see me. He had a bell, I was like the dog, he, he had a bell. Uh, so he would ring his bell. I lived with the same Lama for 25 years. Old, cranky, old school Tibetan Lama, great scholar. So I sat down and I meditated about emptiness and I thought, I closed my eyes and I said, everything is black, just black. Everything is black, black, black. You know, then I heard the bell, ding, 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 run upstairs. Then when you come into a Lama's room, you have to knock and they say, show. Show means, uh, Come, dog. It's the word you use for a dog. It's a show. Then you come in and you have to get down on your knees, which I won't do, okay? And then you have to slurp. I don't know why. You have to go. It's like respect, to show respect to the Lama and in Tibet. And then he said, Did you meditate? I said, Yeah. What did you meditate about? Emptiness. What's emptiness look like? I said, You close your eyes, everything is black. He said, that's emptiness? I said, yes. He said, that's kukpa, kukpa. 
I said, what's, what's kukpa mean, Lama? He says, idiot. <laughs> you go try again. You go try again. Then I said, don't worry, I know, I know. I read a book. I read a book in America uh, about emptiness. Then I went back to my room, closed my eyes. I watched my thoughts go through my mind and try not to think them. Just watch them. They, they would start over near my ear and go over near my cheek and kind of go out. <laughs> And I would watch my thoughts go and then not attach to them and not think about them. You know, then I heard the bell, ding, ding, ding. Run up, did you meditate? Yes. About what? Emptiness. What's emptiness? Close your eyes. Don't think about anything. If a thought comes, just follow it until it fades away. He said, that's emptiness? Yes. Shintukupa. Oh, what, Lama, what's a Shintukupa? Extremely idiot. You know, and then, then I tried a third time. The third time I, I tried to, what is that? I tried to think everything when it's illusion. Everything's an illusion, nothing matters. Don't feel good, don't feel bad, just be neutral. You know, I thought like that. He called me up. I said, he says, what's emptiness? I said, don't feel good, don't feel bad, don't think about anything. Don't feel happy if someone kisses you, don't feel sad if someone hits you. Just neutral. He said, that's a shindunine kupa. Then I said, what's that? He says, a super idiot. You are a super idiot, you know. So then, what is emptiness? What is meditation? It's that by itself, this is not a pen, okay? By it, we ex we, you agreed, right? By the way, this is a trick in Tibetan debating. We debate four or five hours a day, okay, for 25 years. So the trick is to lull the opponent. Oh, didn't we agree uh, <laughs> that if I put the thing here and the people went out and the dogs, didn't we, we all, you all nodded at that point, didn't you? And then you have to say, yeah, because you did. Anybody want to unnod? <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, it, it is true. By itself, it's not a pen, or else the dog would see it as a pen. They would pick it up, they would try, write a poem to their dog girlfriend, you have a nice tail or something, you see, but they don't, they don't have, uh, they don't see it that way. So why, and then the big question, by the way, this also applies to real estate investments in Manhattan, okay, the building you saw, it's a 12-story building in uh, Tribeca. At the time we bought it, it was a disaster area. And, and we made millions and millions of dollars off that. We bought it for $5 million. Reagan paid for it. And Dinkins, the mayor of New York, and we didn't pay electricity, and basically free. And now it's uh, Saatchi and Saatchi is next door. And it's, now it's one of the prime uh, areas in New York. So what I'm talking about, the pen applies to real estate, and it applies to business, and it applies to your wife or husband. Okay. So it's not just the pen. If I see a pen, why do I see a pen? And if the dog sees something to chew on, why? Because if we can answer that, we could make a real estate investment, right? And make a lot of money, you see? Why do I see a pen, you see? And the answer, according to ancient wisdom, is that there's a seed in my mind. I have a seed in my mind. And, and then that seed opens. When, when Geshe Michael goes like this, slow motion, right? Slow mo, Geshe Michael goes like this. And he says, what is this? And then you see a pen, right? According to this thinking, there's a seed in your mind for a pen. And that seed, as I, as I extend my hand, in the same instant, that seed opens in your own mind. And, and actually a picture of a seed, a small picture of a seed comes out of that Sorry, a pen. A small picture of a pen comes out of your mind and, and your mind puts it on this object. And the dog has a different seed in their mind and, and a different picture arises in their thoughts and a different picture comes out. And a picture of a good real estate investment in a bad, bad area of New York. Tribeca was the worst area in New York. Now it's the meat packing district, right? It's hot. It's really hot now. The real estate is crazy. How do you see opportunities like that? How do you know something's going to happen, right? How do you know that a certain area is going to be worth 10 times more in five years? How do you know those things? If you have a seed in your mind, 
you can know those things. And if you don't, then you'll probably chew on it, okay? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not kidding, okay? Everything according to ancient Tibetan idea is coming from your own mind, but not randomly. There's a, you can control the process, okay? Is this a real pen? Yes or no? Don't, is it? Yeah, it's real. I have this joke. I say, anybody who thinks it's not real, come up here, I'll give you a mustache. <laughs> you know, like, I can, you can have a Hitler mustache, a Saddam Hussein mustache, anyone you want. You know, like, you know. Of course it's real. Is it coming from your mind? Yes. If it wasn't coming from your mind, then the dog would see a pen. Get it. You must get that, okay? And it's true. It's true. It is coming from your mind. If it's not coming from your mind, then the dog would see a pen. So in the monastery, somebody will say, it's coming from my mind, but it's still real. I can still write with it. And, the, and they get a rosary from the Lama. Just, they say, the last word comes out of their mind, out of their mouth. They say, it's, it's coming from my mind, but it's still real. Then they say, what's wrong? What did I say wrong? You know, Lama will say, it's not real even though it comes from your mind. It's real because it comes from your mind. Like, say it right. Say it correctly. It's not real even though it comes from your mind. It's real because it comes from your mind. And nothing that didn't come from your mind could be real. Okay? There's nothing in the world that doesn't come from your mind which is real. Okay? Everything that's real, that works. Real estate investments, real, uh, real estate investments. They also come from your mind, and that's what makes them real, and you can control them, and then you can, you can have a comfortable life, material life, you can donate money to many causes, you can help many people. Then the question is very simple. But by the way, we will take a break, okay? But I gotta get the basic stuff in before the break in case somebody runs away. Um, the big question then is simple, simply becomes, how do I plant a seed? You see? How do I plant a seed? How, how is a seed planted in the mind? Because then I could garden the next six months of my life. I could purposely plant seeds for financial independence. I could make my husband more affectionate. I could return my wife's interest in intimacy. I could uh, fix my bad back. I could make my household more peaceful. And my own mind, your thoughts also are arising from seeds in your mind. Your own thoughts are also coming from seeds. And you can change the capacity of your mind, okay? You can, change, you can learn foreign languages. You can play upright bass after never playing it in your whole life. Just pick it up and play it. You see, you can do cool stuff if you know how to plant seeds. So here's how you plant a seed, okay? Mm. Okay, Scotty, it's time for some money. You have any money? This is how I make extra money. I borrow money from him. <laughs> now I always forgot to give it back. Nothing. Yeah, my mind is not creating. Okay. I'll take the example of money. It's not because I'm concerned with money. I don't care about money much. I didn't go live in a monastery for 25 years because I wanted to make money. Uh, I went there because my mother died. My mother died very badly. And I left school. I was in Princeton. I left. I walked out. And I, I went to India because I wanted to know why. You know. Then I, the Dalai Lama made, forced me to finish my degree. But, uh, but money is a good example. You see why? Money is uh, measurable. You see, if I told you I'm 200 million times happier than I was last year, you can't prove it. I can't prove it. Uh, but if I say I have $200 million company, then you can look it up online and you can check it. So money is good for example, just for an example, okay? I'm not trying to make you all greedy or something, okay? It would be nice, right, to have enough money. As much money as you want. And you never have to think about it, okay? Somebody else does the accounts. Right? Where is she? In the, those two in the back, <laughs> in the corner. <laughs> They're probably going to show me books or something. Nah. Okay. Uh, 
how do you plant a seed for some money, you see? Uh, then according to the system, that thing which you want to plant a seed for, you must give it to another person. That thing which you want to plant a seed for, you must give it to another person. And there is no other way to plant a seed. And according to these ideas, there is no other way to make money, not possible. The only way, every penny of the world's economy has been generated by generosity. Uh, all money is, is a, all money is a, is a mental impression. And that impression can only be planted by, by serving another person with money, you see? So it, it's a very beautiful idea and, it's, and it works, okay? Then people automatically, you're sitting there, I can see your mind. We are trained, right, for 25 years to see the other guy's mind, right? I can see your mind. Oh, my mother was very generous and she just got more and more broke. Every year that went by, she gave more money and then she got more and more broke and she died broke, right? You would think things like that. You know generous people who didn't make $200 million and Warren Buffett bought their company, right? You know that. And then I say, they didn't know the technique. They didn't know how to plant the seed. They planted some seeds, but they was like taking uh, watermelon seeds and throwing them on the floor, concrete floor. They did the right thing, but they didn't know how to do it, you see, and they didn't plant it properly. Uh, people are kind, people are giving, people are generous, but they don't know how to, how to make that seed grow in the right place inside the mind, okay? If you learn that, you can have everything. You can have whatever you want. It's very beautiful. So the technique is actually kindness, right? It's cool. Isn't that nice that the way to get rich is to be kind? With, with uh, technique. I teach a lot in uh, South America, con technica. In Russia, it's a se technikum, right? It's always in every country. It's fang uh, fa in Chinese. Uh, you have to know the technique. So for these two nights, my job is to teach you technique, how to be kind. Uh, how, to, how to be kind and plant a seed. And then the things you want, you can have, okay? I often think uh, of uh, the person, I have a long spiel I do, I'm not gonna do it, okay? I'm gonna save you the trouble. But I think about the guy who invented uh, farming, right? And they were hunter-gatherers before that, they went out in the forest, they tried to find some wild berries, they tried to find rice, Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. When they didn't find rice for enough days, the family died. And that was the way it was. You wandered around the forest, and if you got lucky, you lived for another week. You see what I mean? That was the old way. What do we do now? Take some seeds, dig in the ground, put the seeds there, cover it with technique. Fertilize it properly, correct watering, not too much, not too little, all at the same, correct time, know the technique of farming, and you will have rice next year. That's how, and because of the invention of farming, civilizations can rise. People have time to read books, and write books, and write music, and jazz, and, and, and have a city. You can't have a city of, of gatherers, hunter-gatherers cannot make cities, okay? In our stage of evolution in this world, everybody in this world, almost everybody, is a hunter-gatherer. They are wandering around Phoenix looking for money, you know, hoping to find some, you know, or a partner, or a yoga class that can make them young. You see, <laughs> people are wandering around Phoenix looking hoping, you know, and, and a, according to a, a really, a diamond cutter state of mind, these people are all crazy. They're all like cavemen. They are just like cavemen. And then they're, they're stunned. Person say, what? What'd you do today? I went looking for a job. Why? I need money. Why didn't you just plant some? I don't know how, you see? We are like that, you see? 
Imagine if I know how, suppose I know how to plant money. Imagine how frustrating it is to watch people suffer their whole life looking for money out in the forest, and if they don't get it, they die, right? So here's how you plant it. Just learn to plant it. And I truly believe that it will change the future of, of our world. I believe it's another step in civilization. I believe that 50 years from now, if our work succeeds, people will just plant what they need. Where? Tell me where. In other people, okay? Uh, this system is like an echo or a basketball, okay? You can't make an echo without a wall. You cannot bounce a basketball without a floor. You cannot plant a mental seed without another person who is in need. It's not possible, cannot be done, okay? So the first job in, in this system is, I have to find someone who wants some money. <laughs> you see, it sounds crazy, right? I wanna make money, well what are you gonna do? Well, of course I have to find someone who wants money and then help them make money, you see? It also makes you extremely popular. <laughs> no, I mean, have $200 million and give it away. Everyone's like smiles when you walk in the room. Uh, the system is that uh, you need someone else who, need, who wants us some money, okay? You need, can I try? Will you, do you mind? I'll give you some, his money, I don't care. Uh, so I want to plant a seed in my mind for money in the future, okay? Do you get a watermelon five minutes after you plant a seed? No, there's a maturation process, okay? Same with mental seeds. Don't think you're gonna give her 10 and get 100 before you leave the room. It's possible, but you have to be a really good farmer, okay? In the beginning, it will take a, a couple of weeks or something, okay? So uh, I, want, I want $100 in my life. And I'm not greedy, I wanted to help more refugees. I want more money to help more refugees, okay? So then I must give, I must plant the seed. I reach out, she reaches out her hand, now watch, I gotta, it's gotta be higher. Okay, one, two, three. It makes contact with her hand, close. I let go, then the seed is planted in my mind, okay? How? How did it get into my mind? I saw myself give through my eyes. My eyes are like a, what do you call? A lens of a camera. And my mind saw my hand. And my hand let go. And in that moment that my hand, that my hand lets go, and my mind sees my hand let go, I plant a seed. That's all, okay? You cannot use this system without other people. Not possible. And they must be in need and you must provide what they need, okay? Good? Okay. <laughs> Don't let him take it back. No, you got more? No, that's okay. Uh, then there's technique, okay? There's technique involved. You know many people who are generous. Uh, they did not make uh, millions of dollars, okay? And that's just uh, true. So after the break, I suggest after the break, when you are well restored, uh, let's start talking about technique, okay? We'll start tonight and we'll continue into tomorrow. There's a technique from ancient times, Diamond, Jing Kan Jing, Diamond Cutter Sutra, uh, which you must learn, okay? And if you understand that technique, you can make changes in your spouse, you can make changes in your health, uh, you can change your financial situation, okay? Just in case someone leaves, I'll ask you a question. Is this a selfish thing to do? To give money because you want it? I think not because uh, it's a win-win. It's a win-win. Is she upset that I'm using her to make money? No, she just made 10 bucks. <laughs> uh, am I happy that she let me give her the money? Yes, I will make 100. If I know what I'm doing, 100 will come. Okay, is that a selfish thing? I don't think so, especially if it's part of my intention when I help you that I should be successful and people will copy me. People will imitate me. They will say, how did you make 200 million? I say, just give. Con technica. 
with technique, give with technique, then people, unless you're insane, you will try it. You, some guy standing up there, you can check online, he did a certain thing. Oh, then I'm going to try it, okay? He, he looks like he did it. It, it makes sense. It's even kind of, there's a deep logic to it, and there's a compassion to it. I like it. This is success with compassion, you know? I like it. If it's true, then this is the way the world should run. And everyone would copy me, and then there would be no poverty in the world. Half the people would be getting the $10. Half the people would be farming the $10, $100. You see what I mean? If this, if this system is true, it would remove poverty from the world, okay? Simply. That, and that's not selfish. That's love. That's compassion, okay? All right. Uh, we'll take a break. Uh, my suggestion is don't change your whole life in one night, right? We, in our tradition, you should change very slowly. And you should do a practical experiment. You should choose. And in fact, the first uh, step to the seed planting technique on the small piece of paper is to decide what you, what's your experiment going to be, okay? Choose an experiment in your life. 25% of your company, right? Some part of your life. Choose something that you would like to, to some goal in your life or something. It could be financial, you know. I want to, I want to pay off my credit cards in three months or something. Or it could be, I want to make $60,000 in the next two months or something. You decide, set a goal. Uh, or it could be your relationship. I want the most, one of the most difficult karmas of all to create is uh, to get your husband to wash the dishes regularly. So, you know, you could set that as a goal. Uh, it could be physical. I have some physical problem or like that. It could be mental. I have, I get depressed sometimes or, or I feel a lack of motivation sometimes, like that. Choose something 25% of your factory that you want to work on tonight, okay? Because otherwise you're wasting your time and I'm wasting my time, okay? You choose something. Don't, don't change your whole mafia factory in one night. Like, choose a, a little part of your life and say, okay, they, this guy, you know, let's try it, you know? I'll make a small investment in your system. I will, I will make one goal I will state in one simple sentence what I would like to achieve in the next three months or something like that. Set a goal, okay? Otherwise, there's no reason to come here. There's no reason for me to talk. Robbie do all this work. Bonnie do all this work. Mercedes. All these people, you know, paid for things. And it took a lot of work to, to pull this event off. For us to get a free night is extremely rare. So let's use the time. You decide something you want in your life, okay? Anything, anything you want, but choose something, okay? That's step number one. You have to, you have to choose something. I, I'll give you a question, funny question. If a person comes to me and says, I don't know what I want, what should I tell them? What's the way to plant the seed to know what you want? Yeah, help someone else figure out what they want to do with their life. But we did, we're ahead of ourselves, okay? But if you don't know what to put down for number one, help somebody else put something down, and it will come, okay? So step number one, decide what you want. Right now, I'm going to do something very rare, which is to shut up for one minute. <sighs> Let's see if I can really do it. Okay, they have a clock. I'll shut up for one minute. Honestly, really, from my heart, Please think of something you'd like to, to have in your life. Anything. It doesn't matter. Okay? Up to you. You don't have to tell anybody. I'll, I'll try also. Okay. One minute. You okay? Everybody have something? Try. If, if the mafia guy in Kiev can try it, you can try. You can make some small investment of your time. Okay? Uh, so that's number one. Please don't forget. Tonight and tomorrow, keep that in mind, okay? Keep that in mind, okay? Second step on your refrigerator card. Uh, 
you must identify another person in your life who wants the same thing or something similar, okay? It doesn't have to be exactly the same thing. Some guy told me, I, I want all the vanilla ice cream I can get. Can I, can I give my, my friend wants chocolate chip. Will I still create the right seeds? I said, yeah, there's a little bit of leeway here. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> so, yeah, someone who wants something similar to you, but pretty much the same, okay? Now, I'll tell you an almost universal reaction in every continent of the world. I don't know anybody who wants that, you know? People come to me. Then I, I say, you look for 24 hours through your family, through your friends, through your coworkers, through your neighbors. Look for someone who might want something similar to what you want. Get back to me. Email me. Then they always find 10, okay? They always find 10, which proves that we just don't pay attention to what other people need, okay? It just proves who we are, you see? I don't know anybody who's having trouble with their husband. Check, <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, get back to me in 24 hours. Then they're like, everybody's having trouble with their husband. I said, good, you have more material to work with, <laughs> you know? Okay, so uh, find someone who wants the same thing that you want. Part of the second step, by the way, in, in Tibetan, these are called shi, say shi. 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 Sampa. 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 Jorwa. Jorwa. Tartuk. Tartuk. Shi. shi. Sampa. Sampa. Jorwa. Jorwa. Tartuk. Tartuk. Leki lam. Leki lam. The four together are called leki lam. Those are the four words in Tibetan. The second one is sampa. Sampa means find a person who almost wants the same thing and make a plan to help them, okay? Make a plan to help them. Now, the help does not have to be professional, okay? I'll tell you why, okay? Geshla, I decided what I want, step number one. What do you want, step number one? I want to be financially independent, and right now, I'm deep in credit card debt, you know? Then I said, okay, what's step number two? Choose a person who has the same problem. Okay, find someone else who has credit card problems. They're not hard to find. Okay, then what's the second half of number two? Oh, I have to make a plan to help them. Okay, take them out to a Starbucks. I, always, I even call them the four Starbucks steps, I think, sometimes. Uh, <laughs> you know, take them to a Starbucks and talk to them and help them. That's step number three, by the way. Step number three is uh, go to the Starbucks. Go to the Starbucks, okay? Step number two is identify a person who needs the same thing, and make a plan, okay? Which Starbucks will you take them to at what time and on what street? I think it's Scottsdale and Fifth Street or something, right? There's a little Starbucks there. Oh, there's one higher up. Yeah, I know where they are. Uh, but you should ask me a question, okay? I'm, by the way, usually I don't give you questions till the second day because you don't know enough to ask a good one. But we'll see. We'll see if we have a little extra time. We have about half an hour. If I can finish, think of, think of, I'll tell you what, tonight think of some tough questions for me for tomorrow, okay? Maybe tomorrow we, in the middle we'll do some tough questions. Give me some good questions, tough questions. In the Tibet we like tough questions, you know? Yeah, sa. Like that, then you knock the guy's head. But I won't do that. Um, but you should ask me. <laughs> you should ask me. You want me, who's a financial incompetent, to take out someone else who's having financial trouble and give them advice? <laughs> you know, <laughs> is that step number three? <laughs> yes. Uh, but it's fortunate that intention is 90% of seed planting, okay? All you have to do is want to help them and take a good shot at it. And that's enough. The desire to not ignore other people's problems, the desire to help them with their problems is enough to plant a seed for your own financial independence. You don't have to be a financial expert because you're not or you wouldn't have to be doing this. Got it? Okay, it's the desire 
to help, which is paramount. And that's 90% of the power of the seed. So make a plan. It must be concrete. It must be specific. It cannot be vague. Then the seed will be vague, and you will get vague results. Discovery card will offer you a card. Okay. <laughs> it happened to me, I know. It, it feels really bad. Um, okay. Uh, to plant a seed properly, it must be extremely intentional and extremely clear in your mind. There must be a clear plan. I will take them out, and it has to be regular. I will take them out every Friday, uh, Starbucks on Scottsdale and whatever the crossroad is, and I will give them... 45 minutes of my time, and not less. I will give them 45 minutes of my time, and I will try to help them. I will support them in, in their financial problems. Okay? That's all. In this system, if you don't do that, you cannot succeed. Oh, no, Geshe-la, I had some success earlier in my life. That was an accident. Okay? Really. You didn't have any control of it. It came to you because of something you had done earlier, some kindness you had rendered earlier, and you had some success, and then it went away because you didn't know where it was coming from. You see what I mean? It, it's the story of so many successful people, musicians, business people, anything, actors. You know, I, can't, I have an, a, a person in our group who's an Academy Award nominee, I won't say their name, but they can't get a job. They can't get any acting jobs. They'd, and they didn't know why. They didn't uh, know why. What happened? What changed? You were living off an old debit card, and it ran out. And you didn't know where it came from, OK? I have a lot of actors now in my, uh, I teach a lot of actors this system. What do you think is the way to get an acting part? Yeah, when the auditions come, you try to find three other people who might want to audition against you, and you help them, and you support them, and you try to pitch them to the director of the film. Okay, well, who was that? I can say her name, Summer Moore. She's a lady in LA. She tried my system. <laughs> she just got a multi-film part, a leading role. She just did it this way. She helped other people get roles. You see what I mean? with technique, which I'm teaching you, right? Four steps, right? So, third, third part, take them to Starbucks. It must be regular. You don't plant a seed in a day. It, I would say once a week. Try once a week, okay? To fix your finances, make a regular date with someone who's struggling and give them support and help once a week, regularly, okay? Same time each week. What you want, you must offer to others regularly, or it won't work. It, doing it once is not going to ha make anything happen. It's like throwing a, a watermelon seed uh, on, the, on concrete, okay? It's not enough. It has to become a way of life that you help others. It has to become part of your way of life, your regular way of life, okay? It has to become an instinct that when you want something, you try to get it for someone else. It must become instinctual. And right now, we have the opposite instinct. What I want, I must take from others. I must deny to others. I must compete with others. That's, that's our current instinct, you see? And to change an instinct is very, very hard, okay? So it has to be regular. It has to become instinctual. Oh, my husband yelled at me. I have to stop yelling at the kids. The, instead of getting angry at the husband, your automatic instinct is to, who am I yelling at? Why, how should I stop my yelling with someone else? You see what I mean? Like that. It must become an instinct. If enough people change that instinct, this world will change. The whole world will change. People will act differently towards each other. Those who don't want to be yelled at will stop yelling in order to not be yelled at. And it will just be an instinct and the world will change, okay? Okay, step number four. Uh, I think that most generous people in the world who didn't become financially successful 
because of their generosity, could have been if they had done number four, okay? Number four is the most important one. Step number four is the most important one. What's it say there? I forget what it says. What does it say? Yeah, okay. Let's talk about coffee meditation. Mm. Scotty, you, are you available? No. You are? You're not running anything? Okay, come up here and sit in a chair. I have a skit, okay, that I do. And I don't want you to not to see it, even though it's going to take five minutes or something. You have to sit here. Okay, so I lived uh, with this. The Dalai Lama s sent me to, uh, I was in uh, India. I was st studying at his place. And then my mom got very ill. And then he said, uh, I said, well, what should I do? He said, you should go home to Phoenix. You should take care of your mother, you know, tr serve her, you know. Then I'm like, well, is there any llamas in America that I could go work with while I'm there? And he said, yeah, there's one, you know. Then I said, where? Where does he live? And he said, he said the worst thing that the Dalai Lama could say to anybody, <laughs> New Jersey. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm like, what? New Jersey, he lives in New Jersey. I'm like, the armpit of the nation? You know, and <laughs> he's like, yeah, yeah, you have to go to New Jersey. So, you know, I went to New Jersey. I studied with this llama for a while. He's going to be the llama, okay. Then uh, at some point I was working in New York in the diamond business. It's a, from our, you have to come back to the monastery every night. It was a small Mongolian monastery in New Jersey. And uh, in a town of Mongolians, that's another story. But uh, you have to come back every night. It's two hours on the bus and the subway in. It's two hours back, four hours of commuting a day. So I would go into New York, come back. I'd be exhausted. I'd walk in exhausted to the monastery. And then uh, I would hear the Lama upstairs, you know, and he's, uh, he's watching television. Okay, so in the monastery, the big Lamas can watch television, but not the little monks. So I was a little monk. You know, so the little monks are always trying to figure out what? How to get up to the Lama's room for like a half hour. <laughs> so, you know, I'm like, God, I really like to watch them. He used to watch New York Mets, you know. He, I don't know, he decided he loved baseball. Anybody know baseball? Anybody know Daryl Strawberry? 1986 playoffs? Last hit of the game. It's a line drive, and it goes like this, and drops over the wall. That was my llama. <laughs> he was like, he was, he was, oh money, bend me home, oh money, bend me home. I said, Rinpoche, that's cheating. Oh money, bend me home, oh money, bend me home. <laughs> you gotta see the footage. You can see it on YouTube. Look up Daryl Strawberry, 1986. Okay. It wasn't the World Series, it was the playoffs. Uh, the World Series was Mookie Wilson <laughs> hit between the Pittsburgh guys' legs. Anyway, that's another story. Bill Buckner. <laughs> I'm not kidding. These are all voodoo from my teacher. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I'm like, I'd really like to go up there and watch television. So you make uh, him a cup of tea, Tibetan tea. Salt, butter, cream, half and half, milk, nutmeg, and then you have to swoosh it in a churn, uh, in a big butter churn, like a wooden thing, you know. It's a big deal, and they drink 25 cups a day. And then, uh, so I made him a cup, you know, take it up. Then you have to knock on the door, you know, tuk, tuk, tuk. Then he say, show. 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 Yeah, show. You dog. Then uh, you come in, and he'd be watching. You got to do the, he's watching television, you know. Then you come in and say, Lama, you have to serve the tea like this, you know. And you say, I have your tea for you. Give him the tea. And then he's watching the mats. And then you have to go like this. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then uh, you're like watching the mats, you know. And then you think he's not, he doesn't notice that you're there, you know. But Lamas have eyes in the back. You know, and he'd say, he'd say, what are you doing? I said, I, oh, Lama, just let me sit here. I've been four hours on the bus today. You know, I just want to watch some time. <laughs> just, I want to, what do you call that? 
fry my brain for half an hour, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not think about anything. Then he said, okay, you can, what do you call that? Zone out. Yeah, I want to zone out. I lost a lot of English in 25 years. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so I just want to zone out, Lama. You know, and then he'd say, did you do your meditation today? And I'd say, like, no, Lama, I was on the bus for four hours. How am I going to do my meditation today? You have to do your meditation. And I'm like, all right, I'll go do my meditation. Then he'd say, sit on the couch. Then he had this couch. It, it, some wealthy person gave him a couch. It's a, like teak wood and gold thread, real gold thread. Only one person ever sat on this couch, the Dalai Lama. When he came to visit our house, he sat on the couch, right? So he's like, sit on the couch. Then sometimes the Lama asks you to do something wrong so they can hit you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, that's okay, Rinpoche. I'm really comfortable right here. <laughs> Sit on the couch. He really liked Dirty Harry, and he started to talk like Dirty Harry. <laughs> uh, no, when he learned English, it was all, Sit on the couch. Then I, if they have to ask you three times, they hit you anyway. So I'm like, okay, okay, I'll sit on the couch, you know, and I sit on the couch. Lie down on the couch. <laughs> Then in Tibet, your feet are uh, profane. Your feet are uh, very filthy, you know? It's like when Jesus before, uh, when was that? Thursday before Easter, coming up, he washed his disciples' feet. Also in, in the Judaic tradition, the f in ancient times, the feet were very unclean. So in Tibet, you're never supposed to put your feet up on a, anything. And you can't point them at anybody. Put your feet up on the couch, on the gold thread couch. Yes, put them up there. But I thought you wanted me to meditate. We are meditating. Shut up. Lie down. They say katsum. Say katsum. Katsum, katsum means shut your mouth. <laughs> you know? It's funny. Every time I teach people bad words, they remember them right away. <laughs> and I teach them some holy sacred thing, and they can't remember. Anyway, so he says, katsum, sit down. Then lie down on the couch. Then he said, now prop up your head. Then he sent the other monk. He had another servant monk named Jamba. He said, get Mike some coffee. Go get Mike some coffee. Then he, he run down, come back with some coffee. Drink the coffee. Yes, Rinpoche. Think about number three and number two. What? Think about number three. Didn't you go to Starbucks today with anybody? I did, I did. Think about it. Think about the plan you made. Why? That makes the seed work, okay? That makes the seed work. And why your mother didn't get rich, she didn't know about number four, which is coffee meditation, okay? So you, you have to clarify the karma. You have to sharpen it. You have to define it. You have to increase the resolution of the karma. And that can only be done by appreciating yourself and what you are doing, the good things you are doing. When we, when we go to bed, when we lay down on the pillow, we start to worry because we're tired, okay? In the morning, you don't have those worries, right? Only in the dark, at the end of the day, never in the sunlight, of the morning can you have those worries. But as you sleep, as you go to sleep, because you're tired and it's dark, then worries start to come up in your mind. Oh, oh, you know, my boss doesn't like me. Maybe I can't keep my job. I have all these debts. You know, like my husband is blah, blah, blah. And you start to have unreasonable. Worries start to get exaggerated as you fall asleep. In this system, Okay, you can retire, because <laughs> I can't stay like that that so long. Uh, in this system, you, you are required. It will not work unless you do coffee meditation. As you fall asleep, you must struggle against your mind. Your mind will go to bad places, sad places, 
oh, I, I now have enough money, or my so-and-so doesn't like me, my husband said that. And you, you grab your mind like a strong hand. You grab your mind and you say, we are not thinking those things tonight. We are thinking good thoughts tonight about what we did today that was good. And you fight with your mind and you say, come over here. And you think about the good things you did today. Did you take someone to Starbucks? Did you try to help somebody with their credit card debt even though you are submerged in your own credit card debt? Did you at least try? Then you say, yes. What did it look like? They sat across the table on the right side. Which chair? The first of the two on the left. What did they order? Coffee with a little bit of cream, no sugar. What did you say to them? I said, maybe we can help each other with our financial problems. Talk to me. Let's talk to each other. What did you say next? Relive the experience like a, what do you call in a football? Instant, yeah, instant replay. <laughs> yeah. Do some instant replays of the time you spent with another person serving them, and your mind will, whoosh, my husband doesn't like me. I have financial problems. Whoosh, come back, come back, come back, come back. Think about good things you did today. Whoosh. Oh, and my friend said something to me. No, shh, shut up. Katsum. Come back. Now you're going to remember Katsum. Think about good things. That struggle to force your mind to come back to something pleasant as you are falling asleep. That exercise of grasping your own mind in your hand, in your mental hand, and forcing it to think about something positive, what's the name of that? It's meditation. That is meditation. And that's the meaning of meditation. It isn't close your eyes and think about nothing. It's to force the mind to go where you want. You are going to think about good things tonight. You are going to think about the good things we did. That's step four. That clarifies the karmic seed in your mind. It sharpens it. It won't take six lifetimes to ripen, okay? Seriously. <laughs> think about it as you fall asleep. The kind things you have done. There is no expiration date. Good news, okay? If you didn't do a, a single good thing today, you can think about something good you did yesterday <laughs> or 10 years ago, <laughs> okay? <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. And there's another thing in, in the system, in the debate ground that they teach us. If you can't think of something that you've done, then appreciate what someone else is doing, okay? Some kindness you have observed another person doing. You get 10%. At, it's the numbers there in the scripture. I didn't make it up, okay? You get 10%, okay? So, and they don't lose anything, got it? It's an extra 10%, okay? It's not like they, they drop to 90, okay? It's not like that, okay? But that's meditation. That's the meaning of meditation is to, is to compel the mind to think about what you want it to think about. And it's difficult, and that's meditation. And that that hand which grasps the mind and puts it over onto what it, a good thing to think about before you sleep, that muscle will increase. That muscle will get stronger. And that's meditation. And in, in a few weeks, you, you lay back on your bed and automatically the kindnesses you have done today will come to your mind. Okay? And it's very beautiful. The word in Tibetan for meditation is kom. Say kom. Gom means to do something over and over again until it becomes natural to you. And that's the word for meditation in Tibet. Force the mind, as you fall asleep, to think about something good you've done today. And in time, it will become a habit. And every time you lay your head down, you will think of the kindnesses you have done to others. Okay? Then you fall asleep on that. In your subconscious, Every 24 hours, a seed planted that way doubles in its power. How does an untrained person who never saw the inside of a business at all make a $200 million company in the fastest in New York history? How? Coffee meditation. Okay, it's step number four, okay? You don't have to know anything. You just have to know coffee. Okay, step number four, before, as you fall asleep, 
think of the good things you've done. My, mm, we got a call one day at the monastery in New Jersey, and uh, they said, this is the Catholic Church in Lakewood, Lakewood, uh, New Jersey. And it's a very beautiful church. It's a, what do you call it? Cathedral. And they said, uh, the Pope has issued a, what do they call that when the Pope issues a, an encyclical. The Pope has issued an encyclical that all Catholic churches are required to invite other religions, priests, and monks to come and talk about their faith. So would, you, would your Lama come and talk about Buddhism in the church? So, you know, I asked him, and he said, sure, I, I, I'll do it, you know. So I was his driver, and his cook, and his gardener, and his clothes washer, and sometimes his translator. And so I got to go with him, you know. And it was beautiful, it was stunning. We were walking down the middle of this beautiful stone cathedral, you know. And he was like, so happy, you know. He's like, wow, what are those guys in those windows, colored windows? <laughs> Look, the sun is coloring the, the guys, you know. And the priest was like, oh, those are saints, you know. Wow, that's such a good idea. Then he's like, take a note, Mark. We got to have those colored windows in our temple. I'm like, okay, I got it, you know. And then, and then he's looking, and then halfway down the cathedral, he's, he stops, and he, there's this little room off to the side, and a priest is coming in one side, and then this lady is coming in the other side through a different door, and he's like grabbing the priest. He's like, what, you know, what's going on in there? What are they doing in there? And he says, don't worry, don't worry. It's a special custom. What are they doing in there? The priest goes in, the lady goes in, and then the lady tells the priest all the bad stuff she did last week. Oh, well, then what do they do? Well, then he tells her to do some prayers on these beads. Oh, he's like, like a mantra, like, Om Mani Pei Me Hum. Yeah, yeah, Hail Mary, Om Mani, Hail Mary, o over and over, you know? And then all the bad karma's gone, you know? And he says, that's perfect. That's exactly what we do, you know? He says, that's a purification chamber, <laughs> you know? And he says, I understand. I, uh, it's a great custom you guys have, you know. Your church is all right, <laughs> you know. And then, he's, then he goes, my lama goes like this. He says, where's the other one? And the priest goes, what other one? He says, you know, the other room on the left side. And the priest says, what, what do you mean the other one? He says, you know where the lady comes and the priest comes in. And, and the lady tells the priest all the good stuff she did last week. And, he, and the priest is like... You could see he's like getting an idea, you know, like, yeah, maybe we need one of those, a rejoicing chamber, you know, like, so in this tradition, in the Tibetan tradition, uh, we are required to do step number four. Coffee meditation means when you come home, you know, change your clothes, have dinner, wash the dishes. You can watch TV for half an hour, okay? as long as you're supporting the right team. <laughs> and then, uh, change, you know, take your bath, and then put on your night clothes, lay down on your bed, and you must fall asleep thinking about kind things you have done for other people, or this system will not work for you, okay? It will not work, okay? You have to do that. Step number four is, is, is essential. It doesn't work without step number four, okay? And it's a beautiful custom. It's a wonderful custom to go to sleep that way. You sleep well. You never have trouble sleeping. Because your mind, as you fall asleep, you're thinking sweet thoughts about kind things you've done. And the whole night, your mind is happy and contented. And you wake up with a bright, happy mind. You see, it's a very powerful. We could put all those drug companies out of business. You know, it's a very wonderful way to fall asleep, OK? so. You must do step number four, okay? Those are, so those are the four steps to planting a seed in your mind. Number one, decide what you want. Number two, find someone else who needs it and make a plan for a Starbucks. Why do I say Starbucks? I like neutral spaces. If you're going to help somebody, don't invite them to your house and don't go to their house. 
a Starbucks is a neutral place for everybody. Everybody can go to Starbucks. It's comfortable for everybody. I gave this long talk in Buenos Aires, uh, actually for some government. Some of the government is using this in Argentina. I'm not allowed to say who. But uh, so the one guy in the audience, he came up and thanked me afterwards. He had a very nice suit on, and, and I'm like, shake his hand. He says, I want to thank you. I said, well, you're welcome. And he I said, what do you do? He says, I'm the manager of all the Starbucks in Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> He says, do you have stock in Starbucks? I said, not yet, you know, <laughs> but uh, so uh, <laughs> find a neutral space, okay? It doesn't have to be Starbucks. I guess it could be McDonald's. Or that's a little harder, but find a neutral space and, and take them there, okay? And make a real plan and then plant your karmas like that. We have about, I think Robbie or, or Bonnie's going to make a talk after. Uh, Maybe one or two questions, if you, if you have any yet, I don't know. And, and don't be shy, okay? We are trained to be attacked. And uh, I am often attacked, as you may find out, and I'm happy, so go for it. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I will give two examples, and I'll repeat her question. She said, what if the person that you've chosen to help doesn't really want to help? I, I will give two examples. Uh, one, if I have a problem with anger, who should I take to Starbucks? Don't be British. <laughs> yeah, someone else. Sorry if there's any Britishers in here. Oh, there's, uh, where, where is that? Yeah, sorry, Esther. Don't take it personally. You're in Arizona now. Uh, yeah, you should find the angriest person you can find. But you don't go to them and say, you know what, out of all the people I know, you're the angriest person I know. <laughs> so my suggestion in that case, and this works very sweetly, you, you go to them and you say, look, I've just realized I have a problem with anger, and I wondered if we could just work together. I wondered if you could help me. Because you, what you do is you, you put it this way. You aim it this way. I have a financial problem. I ha I'm underwater with my credit cards. I don't need a financial expert. I just need a friend who can talk with me once a week. Would you be willing to talk with me once a week like that? So you can, that's how I would approach the angry person. <laughs> Otherwise they might punch you. So do that. Also in this tradition, we are not allowed to uh, force our opinions on other people. I'm not allowed to bang on your door, grab you by the collar and say, do you accept the four Starbucks steps, <laughs> you know? And uh, we're not actually not allowed to, uh, we're actually not allowed to uh, push these ideas on other people. If they want to know, if they're happy to learn, we're, we're encouraged to share. And if it seems like they don't want to learn, we're encouraged to leave them alone. And, and, you know, just pray that they have a good life and they're happy. And we're, we're not allowed to, like, what do you call that? Um, proselytize. We're not allowed to proselytize. Mm. But I'll, another answer to your question. If I have a problem in my life that the people I offer help are not willing to accept that help, which would make me happy to give, what should I do? No, or I should be more willing to accept help. You see? And then my seeds will change. And then the people I meet will be more willing to accept my help. Because giving help is a pleasure. And it's a high pleasure. It's the highest pleasure in life. To be denied that pleasure is a very sad thing. So if people in your life are denying you the pleasure of helping them, it may be that you are refusing the gifts of others. And then you have to be more willing to let someone give you a gift. You know what I mean? And then your seeds will change. And then suddenly you'll, you'll meet people who, who are dying to have your help. Because giving help is a pleasant occupation in life, right? Uh, okay. We'll do more questions tomorrow, okay? And thank you for coming. I try to imagine uh, someone who believes he has learned to plant anything he wants in his life and he wants to share it. 
he wants other people, like the first farmer, is trying to talk the second farmer into not eating all the rice, but bury some underground. And the second farmer's like, you're crazy, man. And you now, give some, give some money to get money. Give some of what you have to, to get, and it will come, okay? It will always come, and you can't stop it, okay? All right, did you have some announcement? Yeah.